Welcome back and thanks on being on time for this session. Uh, Zoran is here. Zoran was actually a part of the UN conference uh, uh, event last night that I mentioned. So I'll just take 30 seconds of his time for feedback because he was a really important part being a moderator of roundtable sessions. Yeah. So what do you think about the UN conference concept? You know, yeah. I spoke greatly of it at the opening. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I think it is uh, pretty good for the first time. <laughs> for the uh, first time. No, I, I think it, it's a success. I think the, the UN conference in, is a format that you have to figure out on your own, depending on the type of people you have and the topics you're covering. Yep. And I think it was a very, very good uh, uh, for, for the first time. I think I, I learned a lot, uh, both the sessions that uh, actually three sessions, yep. I learned a lot. And I think people really uh, liked, uh, liked uh, the idea. I spoke to several other participants. And I have a few suggestions and ideas for the next Beautiful. one to make it even yeah. better. Yeah, we, we want to keep that rolling. Maybe do it a couple of times a year. Don't have to tie it to the next HipCon. So you'll all be invited at some point to participate in, in something like that. Okay, Thank Zoran, you. so you are a teacher. You're a founder of Deep Nets. You are yes. also a, a you know, public speaker. Yeah. You, you, you frequent different events. So what shoes do you fit, feel most comfortable in? Well, I like challenges. I uh, like doing all those things. Uh, each different type of activity has its like uh, mm -hmm. own challenges. When you get uh, uh, bored of like academic work and yeah. just research, and then you, I like to get jump into shoes and make some real world project and uh, work on development. And sometimes, uh, when you got uh, uh, enough of that, you, you look for the open new horizons and then go to the research and uh, I think I like a combination of all. And I like, really like working with the community and participating in events like this and I'm a big uh, open source fan and uh, Java co contributor also. Oh, beautiful, yeah. So stay around if you'd like to hear more about deep learning. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So uh, hello everybody and thanks you, thank you for coming to this session. Uh, the idea of this session is to uh, show you how, how, how to get started uh, with deep learning. Uh, deep learning being one of the like, most uh, promoted technology for, for the last uh, like, I don't know, five years, and machine learning in general and AI. Uh, and there are lo lo more and more developers getting into it, but uh, uh, depending on your background, what you already know, that can be uh, more or less uh, difficult uh, experience. And the idea of this session is uh, to give you idea what it is all about and what would be the easiest learning path for the software developer to start building something, to start using deep learning uh, in your application. Because uh, um, a lot of materials and courses that are available online tells you, okay, you want to do deep learning, you have to learn uh, statistics, you have to learn linear algebra, you have to learn differential calculus, you have to learn uh, some uh, signal processing and stuff like that, and then you are ready to uh, do uh, deep learning. Basically, they tell you go back to school and learn everything that you have missed and then you will be ready, and that m might be discouraging for um, many, many software developers, like mainstream software developers. So one of the uh, initiatives that I'm working on at the moment is uh, making uh, uh, especially Java stronger in the, in the field of machine learning uh, with a focus on deep learning, which is uh, maybe uh, probably one of the most uh, uh, interesting uh, fields uh, of uh, machine learning. So as uh, already announced, I uh, teach software engineering and artificial intelligence at the University of Belgrade. And uh, I'm also working as a, a side project on uh, development of a deep learning platform that will uh, make, it, uh, make deep learning more approachable to software developers. Uh, as a part of my open source work, I, I've been working on the neural network framework Neurof, which uh, won some significant awards in the Java open source community. And it is mainly being uh, used a, as an educational tool uh, at university. And based on the lessons learned from that project, uh, we are now working for something that should be more universal and more production ready uh, solution for Java for deep learning. So, uh, how many of you is familiar with machine learning? Yeah, quite a lot, but not all of you. Uh, uh, to be honest, I don't see uh, it's a bit dark. 
Uh, so uh, the way, um, one of the things uh, that uh, software developers um, maybe don't understand uh, when they're getting into deep learning and machine learning is uh, what are the benefits? Why should I be doing that? And recent survey that we did on Twitter uh, shows that those are uh, like a top two, top two uh, dilemmas they have. And why do we need deep learning in your, in your application? Why is it something that you should care about? Well, uh, for first, that's something that your users expect. Uh, they, a, a, and every company out there that's building some kind of software is looking a way to, f well, to make their application smarter and to make it more user-friendly. And that's something that their users ex expect. That's like a need in order to stay competitive and stay uh, on the edge. Uh, so machine learning in general, and especially deep learning, uh, allows you to create smarter applications that can learn from examples, uh, from example usage, and in different ways enhance the typical existing uh, workflows. Uh, the most, uh, the easiest way to look at it is like it's a kind of a next level of intelligent automation that can reduce the workflow for end users, and that's, that's something the uh, users really like. So also it is important to know that it is not possible to solve everything. Sometimes when you look at the uh, uh, bus that is all around, it seems that, like uh, uh, deep learning it can do everything. It, it's not like that. It can uh, solve uh, simple tasks and th that can are typically boring tasks, uh, but that cannot be automated using a fixed set uh, of rules and that require a, a kind of uh, experiential knowledge, uh, something that humans are doing. So those are the uh, ideal candidates for applying machine learning and deep learning. Uh, the way, so j just the definition of machine learning, it's like uh, that you can find uh, over the internet is really 50 years old. So that's like a uh, system that can uh, learn to perform operations without explicitly being programmed. So that might sound very very uh, sci-fi and very exciting. But in my opinion, uh, after 50 years, I th think we need a different view o o o on those systems. And uh, the way software developers should look uh, at, at those systems, it's a kind of a self-configuring algorithm, right? It is algorithm and it is programmed, so it is not able to uh, perform real learning like uh, high-level cognitive functions, but it can learn to figure out some patterns and somehow it can be useful in our uh, uh, programs that we developed if applied a, in a certain context uh, uh, to, to solve some problems that matter to users that bring value uh, to business. So in general, you can think of machine learning as a self-configuring algorithm that is tuning some uh, set of internal parameters using example data. Uh, in that context, deep learning uh, made a uh, significant uh, step forward uh, with uh, large amounts of data being available in a sense that it, its accuracy keep, keeps increasing as the amount of data grows. So traditional machine learning alg algorithms uh, typically have better performance for the smaller amounts of data. But with the, as the scale of data grows, deep learning algorithms can uh, uh, significantly outperform that, them. And that's the uh, reason for the uh, all buzz in deep learning. Also something that uh, you can also hear more uh, on the other session that is available today, deep learning automated some steps in the machine learning workflow. So especially when it comes to image recognition, uh, some steps of data preparations were um, uh, done manually by the developers or researchers. And now uh, deep learning uh, provided the way that the entire, entire workflow could be automated and learned. So that was a, a big step forward and that's one of the reasons that the, the deep learning uh, term was coined. Uh, what can you do with it? Well, you can do typical machine learning tasks like classification, regression, also clusterization. Uh, and uh, in a specific uh, application domains, you can, learn, uh, you can apply it for image recognition problems, 
text understanding and in general any kind of uh, pattern recognition. So uh, typical challenges uh, for uh, software developers when they start thinking about deep learning, yeah, it is something new, it is cool, it can uh, solve many problems, is to figure out what can be improved with deep learning, what would be good use case. Because uh, when, when you have a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So people, when they start thinking about what problems they could be solved using machine learning or deep learning, uh, every problem looks like a machine learning problem. But uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, always the case. You know? So you have to think about do you have enough data uh, is the data, uh, the amount of data, is the data right quality, and uh, what is the value for doing that, uh, what is the benefit for uh, using machine learning to solve that problem. If there is other ways to do it, then uh, maybe machine learning and deep learning is not a good choice. Uh, next step is how to prepare data and understand what is actually going on. Because typically sometimes deep learning solutions uh, give uh, users and users and uh, developers something that they already know. So that's uh, obviously not not the good choice. And uh, software developers, uh, not all of them, but uh, most of them that are used to developing business applications are not uh, proficient with statistics. And uh, it is important part of actually understanding uh, what uh, what uh, should be inputs, what should be outputs, how to prepare data. And that's something that, that, that should be uh, very carefully prepared because uh, machine learning systems are garbage in, garbage out systems. So if you don't have good data to fit it, then uh, the result is uh, certainly not going to be uh, good. Uh, then uh, there is a step of building models, and typically these deep learning uh, models have a lot of parameters. Uh, there is a lot of research going on, and this is technology in development. So uh, nobody knows all the answers, so people try different things. Uh, something works for some problems, some other settings works for other problems. And uh, basically when you start using some uh, algorithm, there are many uh, let's say external parameters that you have to try out to figure out what works for best for use case. There are also some recommendations, but typically when you uh, first meet uh, with uh, all these settings, you don't uh, know how to tune them uh, without a uh, deeper understanding of how it works. So th those are, I'm just uh, talking about the problems and later I explain how we are thinking about solving that, those problems. Uh, now, when you build a model and you get good accuracy, uh, you want to uh, understand and know how it will behave when you put it in production and that there are uh, methods uh, to evaluate model and understand how it will behave in different scenarios and uh, it is important to understand those metrics, evaluation metrics, for different types of problems. There is a set for classification metrics and for regression uh, problems. So sometimes uh, that's something that uh, if they didn't have like a uh, detailed course in machine learning and statistics, uh, developers are not familiar with. So that's uh, another topic that they should uh, understand. And at the end, uh, when, uh, when you have created the model, you have to put it in production to integrate into existing applications. So that maybe uh, sounds easy when you go through all that, but in practice, it's not like that. It, uh, it depends what tools you have been using for building model, what tools are you using in production, and uh, what scale of data you have in production. So there are many examples of the uh, well-known failures, uh, uh, people building models and uh, getting awards. Uh, I think uh, Netflix uh, case is the most famous one. They developed a movie recommendation and they were awarded what, $100,000. But they never managed to put that model in production because the scale of data they had just couldn't work with the model that uh, had best accuracy uh, during the competition. So uh, to 
several examples. This one example, I'm going to show you uh, one very, very basic uh, problem because what I learned from uh, giving uh, talks like this, uh, explaining different aspects of machine learning, people usually understand, yes, it's nice, but they don't know how to start, what to do with, with it, uh, or how it can be used, and, and things like that. So I'm going to start with a one a very easy example, Hello World for Machine Learning, and uh, give you entire example through uh, what it does, uh, how it works inside, and how it can be implemented in, uh, in Java uh, using uh, open source library DeepNets. So the simplest problem that can be performed uh, and which, by the way, is very useful in many scenarios is binary classification, which is uh, simply assigning some input to one of the two, two, uh, two categories, which is usually true or false or yes, no. In the case of a different domain, if for example, if we uh, talk about credit card fraud detection, it can be it is fraud or it is not fraud or if we have uh, some different two classes, uh, we can get out the probability that it belongs, that something, some object, some input belongs to two classes. So typically, uh, the model that we are going to be working with here, this uh, deep learning uh, fit forward neural network, it takes uh, uh, input of vector, you'll see the term vector, which is basically just uh, a float array, you know, uh, an array of numbers. That's something the developers are like familiar. So you represent object as a as an array of uh, a, s a set of characteristics encoded in, in a specific ba way. You feed it into the network, and it says it belongs to a specific class or it does not belong to a specific class. So uh, the model. The uh, machine learning model that we are going to use to achieve this, uh, and which is, by the way, uh, commonly used for this kind of problem, is called uh, feed forward neural network, which is a very basic model uh, uh, on which are almost all advanced deep learning models are also based. So you might hear f uh, analogies that is like a brain like circuit like, and uh, so. Don't think about that way. It is really far away from the way how brain works. But you can think uh, about it as a graph. So you as the software developers un understand very well what a graph is. It's a directed graph. And uh, each node in this graph performs some kind of computation. Um, and um, each node, uh, nodes are organized into the groups called layers. All the nodes in every layer are calculated uh, together. And when they get calculated, they send their outputs to all the nodes in the next layer. Now, one important thing about this graph is that each uh, of these edges in a graph has a, a numeric value per co coefficient called weight, which controls the amount of signal that is being transferred from one layer to another. And those are uh, these configuration parameters that we were talking um, uh, at the beginning of the session. And there is an algorithm called backpropagation, which uh, tunes these uh, coefficients, internal configuration parameters, in order to make this graph to behave uh, in a way that is useful for us. So uh, the entire training workflow uh, typically looks like this. Uh, you prepare some training data, which is a bunch of examples, which contain same inputs and the target outputs. What we feed as an input and what we would like to get as an output. For a binary classification problem, and let's take this example for credit card, card fraud detection, input would be a set of parameters which describe uh, some transaction and output we well, would be a class. Is it a fraud or it is not a fraud? One zero. So uh, once the network calculates uh, its prediction, right, uh, estimation of a class, uh, on the output uh, it calculates the error, the difference between uh, predicted output and the uh, target output or desired output, and there is a 
another component called trainer, which is typically implemented using this uh, well-known algorithm backpropagation, which then tweaks these internal parameters of the graph uh, using some mathematical procedures, optimization procedures, which you can go deeper into, but when you're just starting, you don't have to understand how, how it uh, works uh, uh, in all details. So, uh, to get the big picture, what's going on, uh, typical workflow in machine learning and deep learning includes uh, data preparation, then model building uh, or training, th that's what we talked about in the last slide, and then testing the model or evaluating the model, so calculating different metrics which tells us a kind of estimation how will model this uh, behave when we put it in production. And then uh, we have like a tuning different model parameters, configuration parameters, in order to get best possible accuracy for, uh, uh, for, for prediction. And once we are satisfied, uh, then we are ready to deploy model. So it is similar, kind of like a software development workflow, but it has its differences, and it's important to be aware of that, because um, mach every machine learning model uh, will give uh, a certain degree of accuracy. So it, it will never be 100% accurate, because if it does that, that, that's something called overfitting, so it will probably not be uh, good in production with the new data that it hasn't seen so far. So that's why this uh, t model testing or evaluation uh, is important. So to get uh, uh, deeper in this example with the credit card fraud detection with uh, the binary classification and fit for the neural network, uh, first, when you think about using deep learning for something, think about what is the value, what is the business value of this, uh, why, what problem it solves, and uh, for things like credit card fraud, it is a really important problem, a big problem for our financial institutions. Uh, at uh, one presentation uh, at conference by, given by PayPal, they said, without machine learning, PayPal would not be possible. It wouldn't just wouldn't be possible to detect so many uh, different frauds uh, uh, attempts, and uh, especially with the rate that the strategy changes. You know, as soon as they figure out some rules how to detect uh, fraud, uh, attackers change the way they they attack. And if you would do that manually on such a large scale. Uh, it would just be impossible to uh, stay sustainable. So machine learning and deep learning is the key technology to enable growth and scalability. And that's one of the reasons why it is uh, uh, so important today. And with more and more application in, in network monitoring, uh, cyber security, uh, network administration, uh, application management, uh, if we want to build uh, large-scale solutions and grow uh, without machine learning, that would not be possible. So, just to, like a first point, when you think about going for a project with uh, deep learning, think about what is the value, because if you have to convince your management and people to go in, uh, into that project, you have to have clear answer what is the value of uh, using machine learning. So the, this example that we are going to, to go through uh, just to outline some important aspects of, of, of uh, data preparation. Usually uh, data for use for machine learning uh, is prepared in a CSV format. And in this example, we are going to use this publicly available uh, data set for credit fraud detection. It has uh, 28 uh, uh, anonymized features, amount, of the transaction and the class. I, is it a fraudulent or not fraudulent? And this is how it looks like, so we don't know what these numbers actually represent, but in this case, we don't care. We just feed data into the model. So one of the things that you should be 
uh, you should check, like first when you're going to this binary classification model, uh, is to see if there is the, the if the data set is balanced. So do you have the, s the same number of examples or closely the same number of examples for both of classes, uh, which is usually not the case. So for example, in this fraud detection, we have like uh, uh, we have in total uh, two hundred and uh, uh, eighty-four thousand of rows uh, and only like 500 frauds, you know, so like 280 uh, which are not fraud. So if you do that with th this data without preparing them, without balancing the data set, y you would probably get uh, uh, prediction that uh, most of them are not fraud. It will be very hard to detect fraud. So there are different strategies to, you to do that. One of the simplest one is to take a random sample uh, of uh, both classes and to uh, make them uh, equal. Next thing is that includes usually some statistics and data exploration is you look at, uh, at the correlation with the desired output. So if the data is not correlated, if it does not influence the class, then it, it, it is not important. So it, it, should, it, it is better to leave it out. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to have correlation between inputs because that m can introduce noise and make it diff difficult for machine learning to uh, learn the problem. So those are like a typical tricks that you can do uh, which are pretty standard and uh, we are trying to provide a standard API to do that and the tools. Uh, and I think most of those automated machine learning uh, platforms that are promoted uh, the do those things for you. So here is an example uh, how you could uh, load data and uh, create instance of uh, this uh, deep learning model fit for the network and uh, train it using API from deep nets. What we try to do is uh, create something that is developer friendly, that even if you don't know uh, all the deep learning theory, but just looking, if you know just main concepts and uh, uh, just looking at the API, not even need to look for documentations, you can create like a readable code and understand what is going on. Uh, so one of the main points of the API uh, uh, that is being used here uh, is to have a utility class data sets that allows you to do different things with uh, data. So whenever you need to do something data, you say data sets dot and the ID should give you uh, a list of methods that uh, perform typical operations. Then for creating uh, a models, we are using a builder pattern. Uh, and because typically all the machine learning algorithms uh, have a lot of those parameters that needs to be set. And uh, like in a structured way, uh, the builder uh, pattern allows you to, to, to set all these parameters. Then you can see, uh, and, uh, after instantiating uh, and configuring this uh, fit for neural network, which is like looks like this, this graph, you see input layer, this one fully connected layer, output layer, and you can see maybe some things that confuses you. What is this cross entropy function that is function that is used for classification types of problems, or uh, why is this using sigmoid function and this real function? Those are those like internal parameters which usually confuse developers that didn't get go deeper into understanding what's going on. I'm going to show you next slide how we are going to solve this problem. Uh, so after that, we configured the training algorithm. So that was the trainer part, you know, re re rectangle that says trainer. Uh, we specified the error that uh, we want to reach, so the l lowest, uh, the highest level of error. Specify a number of iterations to train, which is called epochs, and specify this learning rate parameter, which is like a, a step that the uh, algorithm is going to take in e each iterations. So this learning rate is mo maybe mo most difficult to understand, but there are st standard values that can be used for, that, for them. If you start with zero, zero, 001, that, that's a good uh, initial setting. 
And at the end, you just say invoke train method and provide data set to train method and wait for a certain uh, number of iterations. And after that, in order to evaluate and get information how a uh, network is behaving, we have this like uh, also utility methods, evaluate classifier, which does uh, that for you. So as you can see, uh, we are trying to reassemble what ex exists in uh, other platforms and languages like uh, Python, for example, to make it very simple to uh, create a specialized API that provides a lot of utility methods, which allows you to do every operation with basically one me me method call. And if you want to have more flexibility, there is a way to do that. So I'm going to show this example now, how it runs uh, in the how it runs. So this is a credit card fraud example. Mr. Run. So yeah, also this is there is a one piece of code that could not fit in, in this. Uh. So as you can see, the alg algorithm is now running. And you can see uh, these epochs here are changing. And uh, it's logging what is actually going at, at the moment. So this is a training error. As you can see, it in every iteration, in every epoch, it is lowering down the error for the given data set. So the final goal is to make this error be below the sp specified threshold, which is specified with this max error parameter. And at the end, you can see the train accuracy, which tells you how good uh, it is at guessing. So as you can see, it is 97% for the, for the training set. Yeah, and it, it has reached uh, 97 and that stopped. So sometimes, typically, this happens to get not a number. I, I, it's normal. And at the end, you can see this uh, like uh, evaluation, which tells you uh, the result, how accurate it is. So as you can see, um, I didn't explain that part. Sorry. Uh, a, a, a this, uh, in this code, it is a bit uh, extended example in a way that we split the entire data set into training and test set. You see, we just have like a invoke split method and say use 60% for training and use the rest for testing because we want to see how the algori algorithm will behave with the data that it hasn't seen for during the training. So that's a typical uh, way to do it. And again, you just have like one method call to do that. And uh, the way DeepNet tries to simplify understanding what are all those numbers is to provide these uh, comments. So accuracy is how often classifier is correct in total. So whether it, it, it predicts fraud or not fraud, how often it is correct. So for test set, it is correct for 89%. As you can see, it is a bit lower than uh, uh, with training set, which was 97%. So it will probably require a bit more configurations, tweaking parameters and playing with data to increase that. Then another metric which is important is precision, which is how often is classifier correct when it gives positive prediction. Uh, then recall, which is when it is actually positive class, how often does it give a positive prediction? And usually you want to balance uh, these two, uh, and that's why uh, F1 score is used, which is average uh, of precision and recall. So these are like a small add-ons, which you typically don't find in uh, specialized packages like R or Python. People, they assume that you are well familiar with these things. Uh, well, our approach is we assume that you are not familiar and that we want to provide you explanation. And at the end, he here is an example uh, how to create a binary classifier, binary classifier network, right? Using the trained neural network, which provides you just this classify method. And there's also some logic. So you actually don't care what's going on in the neural network and how to convert the inputs to in order to satisfy uh, the format that neural network wants and uh, how to interpret the output results. 
you just have this classifier method and you get the probability that uh, which is just a simple fraud number so for this example that we gave there is very small probability 0 0.005 that it is a uh, fraudulent so just uh, so one way that we want to make this even simpler for uh, software developers and especially for Java developers is to develop a standard API for doing these kind of uh, machine learning tasks. So part of our work, uh, part of this project is working also contributing uh, to visual recognition JSR, uh, JSR381 which provides a standard Java API for visual recognition based on machine learning. So visual recognition is one of the domains which really push the innovation uh, for in, in deep learning area. And um, what we want to uh, do is to provide like a, a collections API for doing various machine learning tasks and including uh, domain of visual recognition. So the way we are trying to achieve this is to have like a generic machine layer task, so uh, like uh, problems for classification and regression, then have abstraction uh, that allows us to use different algorithms for uh, uh, for machine learning and to use different formats of images because there are many libraries for images, especially for Java, and to allow different implementation of this. Uh, generic specification and as a reference implementation at the moment we provide implementation using deep nets. So you can take a look uh, at our work uh, at, at this link and this API uh, will allow software developers to make it uh, uh, much easier to integrate uh, machine learning into existing applications and when something else come out comes out tomorrow it will be very easy to change it without changing the application uh, code itself. So just uh, plug in a different model, a new generation of algorithms, and in that way encourage uh, uh, developers to add machine learning and deep learning capability to their applications. So uh, as an example how something like that would look like, we are very close to achieve uh, this kind of API. So we, want, we will be able to say, I want a binary classifier of this type of objects. So I want to classify transactions. And you will have a builder to set all these parameters and perform model buildings. So you don't need to know about all these steps. And just uh, uh, build and use the model. Uh, the next step in evolving uh, this, uh, th these ideas is also building the tools because there are many different workflows and parameters and in order to make that easy, standardized, provide templates like it is being done in software, ge the software development in general is to build IDE-like tools that will uh, simply guide users through uh, a sequence of steps uh, to create uh, uh, models like this. So I can just show you a few uh, screens how that could look like, like creating new project and then saying hmm, credit card fraud, you go next, so wh what do you want to do? I want to classify data, you could also predict a value which is a regression problem of classic images, but you see we are using language which is very uh, more understandable to, to uh, end users, so let's say we want to do binary classification, saying next, then we choose a CSV file, we have this credit balance credit card, we say what is going to be output, and then let's say, yeah, specify these parameters, and the idea is also to have like a virtual assistant, this guy here, which will answer your questions and uh, help you with configuring all the models. At, at the end, you will get like a project with all the settings, what, uh, what is the data, what is the model configuration, like uh, visual tools that will allow you to drag and drop and change parameters of the models. And all the training parameters provided uh, within 
properties, files, uh, that you can very easily change, which gives you very quick turnaround. Because when building models, you usually need to experiment with different parameters and then running training, also ideal-like environment, okay? And visualizing the error and the accuracy at the same time and uh, applying other dif different options. So DeepNets uh, API is uh, open source, fully open source. This tool is not, at the moment, is not open source. It will be, some parts of it will be open source soon. We are figuring out the strategy how to do it. But for now, you can, you can play with, uh, with, with this uh, Java API tool. So another interesting problem that we have been working uh, recently is to automating uh, uh, some tasks relating to managing Twitter accounts, which is also an interesting problem. We are doing that as a community project uh, with Java Twitter account. And some, uh, we basically want to teach Twitter bots to perform tasks that people who are managing Java Twitter account are performing on a daily basis. It's a routine task. Usually they have interns which are trained over and over to look for uh, relevant content, retweet contents, uh, or disco discover trending content, and in general increase community uh, engagement. So it was like an interesting experience uh, for us to understand uh, what end users need and how they think about applying uh, deep learning in like uh, real world scenarios. And one uh, of the first challenges was to explain what can be done with uh, deep learning. So basically, if we want to estimate the engagement with some Twitter, uh, we are doing like, uh, we can do a classific both classification and regression, so depending of what parameters are going to be used as input. Uh, and what makes sense for end users, because many of the things that we were initially think, yes, let's do this, it, the people who are doing, yeah, we know that that's, of, that that's not of value for us. So it, it was a first thing to figure out what are we actually going to do. And next challenge was when we started gathering the Twitter data using different Twitter analytics tools, we figured out that most of the data is wrong. You know? Because people managing accounts uh, gave us information that showed that the sample is not good enough. You, know, you get like a 15% of tweets from most of the of most of the, uh, uh, the services, and for example, it showed that like 80% of users are from India, which is not a fact. Like 50/50 is, is usually so. That shows that sample is bad, and every every model that we will build on a bad sample of data would probably be wrong. So another thing that uh, Java account is following about uh, 1,000 influential uh, developers, and in that sample, only like uh, 30 accounts were followed. So you really need to, to have people that understand the domain and the problem that you're solving. So just give an example. It's not, deep learning is not just about taking as much data as you can and throwing it uh, at the latest model in the framework, but you need to understand how to uh, explore data and how to see what makes sense for a, for a specific uh, uh, domain. So uh, next, it, it was a challenge how to integrate in the entire workflow, so not to introduce additional work for the users, but uh, you know, just recommend what should be retweeted, and uh, we are working on that. And even in this stage, it, will, it, it, it is useful, so you can expect very soon to have like uh, AI-powered Twitter bots uh, that will help increase the uh, Java community engagement. So when it comes uh, to different options uh, for deep learning in Java, there are several libraries which are uh, considered to be like uh, main players in, in, in the field. One is, of course, TensorFlow for Java, which provides many features, high performance, uh, GPU usage, and uh, direct use of models that are being created in Python. But on the other hand, this API is uh, highly experimental, not actively supported. And actually, when you give it to Java developers, they don't know 
what to do with it. It is very difficult to understand and use, even for experience for developers and uh, definitely not for the beginners. Uh, on the other hand, DeepNets aims to be pure Java, very portable and intuitive API as you have seen. And it, it, it aims to be like a standard Java API for this kind of tasks. The main weakness is that at the moment there is no GPU support or distributed computing, but there is a, uh, we are working on with Tornado VM project from University of Manchester to make this happen. And there is one which is uh, uh, really widely, uh, widely uh, used, which is the deep learning for j It provides many different features, but it's like a, more like a framework and has API which is hard to follow, understand with many parameters. So for beginners, it is difficult to make first steps. For, so if you making first steps, then my recommendation is to try deep nets. And if you need more features, then you can uh, at some point, it, it will be easier for you to switch to other. Uh, so most of things that uh, I mentioned is to uh, understand what you are trying to achieve and recom general recommendation is when starting with some project to start with something small and relatively simple to gain experience and after that you can move to more complex things. So at the end if you would like to uh, put your hands on this and see how it looks like you can go to this address and you can uh, try to play with this open source version which is community edition it provides uh, tutorials and examples, uh, just the one you, you saw today for different problems. And if you want to try to use tool, which is uh, at the moment in, in beta phase with the advanced features to, to make it a very quick workflow and overview what it can be done, uh, then you can also die it as a free trial. So if you have any questions, please ask. Hi. In your first example, um, you showed that there was a number of false, false positives and false negatives. How is that calculated? False positives and false. There's a, uh, you just count them. False positives are those are predicted as uh, positives and which are actually negatives, and the false negatives are the, the opposite ones. So you just count them. How many? Uh, are, are are positive and negative. So it's a like co co confusion metrics. It calculates confusion metrics. Yeah, and how do you detect that something is a false positive? Well, because in the training set, you you specify is it positive or negative, ah. and y then you compare uh, the value that is in training set and the actual outcome of the network. So if the uh, actual value is positive and it is predicted as, uh, uh, as negative, then it is the false negative. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So you can feel free to catch me, I'll That's be right. around. So right. if you have any questions and like more information. Yeah. Sorry, hello. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. one more question. Okay. Uh, so since the big accent is on uh, the data and quality of data, mm -hmm. and in both uh, examples that you showed to us, you didn't go uh, into too much details about what exactly is the data. Can you give us a little bit uh, of a hint, for example, for a credit card fraud or, or this uh, Twitter uh, application? Uh, what, what kind of columns can we have? What, what, what could be important? For example, yeah. so, so things like that. Uh, uh, to be honest, for this credit card example, data is anonymized, so we don't have any idea what it is. So for things like that, you need to uh, uh, talk to a domain expert. For example, for people who are experts in credit fraud detection, and they can tell you uh, what is important. Also, uh, for some uh, basic uh, data exploration, you just uh, run statistics, st st statistic analysis, and you, you can see uh, run correlation. That's one that I, I, I mentioned, and see if there are missing values, uh, if there are any outliers, extreme values that are ju jumping out. There are like a typical uh, steps that you perform in order to figure out 
uh, is it the quality good or, or not. So basically missing values, outliers, uh, distribution, you can draw histograms and stuff like that. And uh, as, since it is important, it is not covered at the moment, but we plan to uh, make it a part of this wizard, make it a part, a part of the workflow. So now some kind of uh, expert system would advise you uh, where to look at. And what about this Twitter uh, application you, you, you were talking about? Is there some, some kind of uh, data that you were looking for specifically in the, in the tweets? That yeah. that so, so for now, what's the most important in social network is engagement. So you want to people retweeting, you want people liking, you want uh, people commenting. So th th this is we created something we call engagement score, taking into account all of these uh, things. Uh, and then uh, uh, feeding that data uh, for predicting uh, the engagement based on uh, uh, hashtags used, uh, people who uh, people mentioned, people who retweeted tweet, number of their followers, uh, and so on. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.